Right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this event, the future um, of digital Britain. Uh, my name is Eddie Copeland. I'm the head of the Technology Policy Unit at the Think Tank uh, Policy Exchange. And it's my uh, great pleasure, together with my team, Cameron Scott and Sarah Fink, to have the luxury of being able to spend our time thinking about how technology impacts policy. And to my mind, it's probably the most interesting area um, to be in. I would say that, I know, but uh, find me a policy area that will not be impacted by technology or data um, in some way over the next five to ten years. All of them will be, and that's why uh, we think it's important to be talking um, about these kinds of issues. Um, it's our strong belief that during the course of the next Parliament, uh, the role of technology could really have major implications, uh, many, many good, potentially some bad, if we're not careful, for individuals, for businesses, um, and for government. And it may not have escaped your notice today that uh, Policy Exchange itself has published uh, today a technology manifesto, basically to urge politicians from across the political spectrum, policy makers from all sides, to put technology front and centre of their thinking uh, for policy ideas for uh, 2015. Um, hopefully you'll have found paper copies on your chairs or at the back. Uh, I think there's also business cards with a QR code which will take you to a web version uh, should you feel uh, technologically inclined. And you'll notice in our manifesto we've tried to touch on the sheer range of issues that tech uh, impacts, that's education, it's the connected society, it's the tech economy, it's digital government, it's internet of things and it's open data, all those different kinds of areas. But above all, we believe there's three key areas, three key goals that we would love to see all parties uh, making a commitment to um, in their manifestos. Number one, build the world's most connected and digitally skilled society. We believe everything depends on actually getting people online and ensuring they've got the skills not just to thrive online, but the digital skills that our businesses need as well. From a business perspective, we think that Britain should be aiming for nothing less than to be uh, the best place outside of Silicon Valley for tech entrepreneurs to come and start and grow a business. And finally, for digital government, we think um, parties should be making a commitment to use tech and data to develop the smartest government on the planet. Uh, we think it's realistic. Britain is well placed to achieve many of these aims, starting uh, with digital skills, the fact that more people shop online here per head than any other country. Uh, our digital sector is worth more of our GDP than it is in any other G20 nation. And some of our digital government plans, some of the things that have already been done, have been borrowed and copied by many other nations around the world. To be honest, we're less concerned that anyone in this room agrees with the specific things we say than that we start talking about it. That we need more people talking about the role of tech in policy. Uh, to my mind, there are too few uh, policy makers and politicians who do so. I'm delighted, though, today to be joined on our panel by three very <coughs> notable exceptions uh, to that rule. Uh, these are MPs who not only speak with great authority about the role of tech and data within their own parties, but also pre-parliament, uh, in their pre-parliamentary careers, um, have backgrounds from engineering to science uh, to tech, um, all these different areas covered today. So I'm delighted to be welcoming uh, Nadim Sahawi, uh, who is also a member of the Number 10 uh, Policy Board, Chi Onwura, um, Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, and also currently heading up the Labour Digital Government Review, and Dr. Julian Huppert, uh, Member of Parliament for Cambridge. Uh, this is dangerous to say in this room, but surely the leading tech cluster uh, in Europe. Uh, and also uh, a well-known champion for a digital bill of rights. Uh, Newcastle have been to recently as well, very, very strong. Um, we need more MPs like these who actually know what they're talking about. I would strongly urge you all, whatever you can, let's make sure at the next election we have a lot more who are talking along the lines um, that these um, who join me here today are able to. In a moment, I will ask them to all kick off with a strictly timed seven-minute opener. I'm now going to make an unsubtle uh, cough um, in the direction of the podium when they take over. And um, please forgive my rudeness. It's just because I'm very conscious that amongst the people in this room, I hope there are plenty of questions on the broad themes 
that are under discussion today. I'd also like to remind you there are 200 people who are on the waiting list for this event who couldn't be here today. So the onus is on all of you, no pressure, uh, to be uh, making sure you're asking those questions. And also, please, I'm afraid the hashtag isn't appearing, tech issue, uh, <laughs> slightly ironic. Uh, the hashtag for today's event is uh, Tech Manifesto. I think our Twitter handles are fairly obvious. I think they're literally first name and surname for each of our three guests. Mine is Eddie A. Copeland, should you feel inclined to quote me, be careful on that. Um, but for now, um, get those questions in mind. I would like to hand over to Nadim uh, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eddie, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, 14 years ago, I started a new business uh, which actually is now down the road from here at Featherstone Street, uh, yougov.com. And it, as it was then known, um, yougov.com was formed in the heady days of the dot-com boom. Uh, the late 90s was a time of great transformation. The internet was ripping up business models and e-commerce looked like it would destroy the traditional idea of a bricks and mortar business. Of course, two weeks after we launched the business, um, yougov.com, uh, the dot-com bubble burst and we quickly found out that no one wanted to know any company with anything dot-com. Wind the clock on four years or so and we had Web 2.0, the rise of user-generated content through sites like YouTube and Flickr, uh, which then led to the rise, of course, to the social networks. These new Web 2.0 applications combined with the rollout of broadband resulted in a higher level of expectations from users of online services. A higher expectation on design, a higher expectation when it came to user experience. And today, we're in a world of mobile. Access to information and services, regardless of where you are, in your pocket. The entire world in your pocket. Brought to you by a web browser, or increasingly through apps. Thanks to 20 odd years of internet evolution, People today, I think, expect a couple of things when it comes to digitally interacting with an organization or service. One, for it to look nice, look good. Two, for it to work first time. And that's about it. Now, Policy Exchange's tech manifesto raises some important points about the number of people that still aren't online. However, the rise of mainstream internet access over the past 20 years has resulted in a very important fact. In 2015, those people who will be voting for the first time have only ever known a world in which the internet has existed. They are digital natives. For them, digital re really is the default. As far as they're concerned, the idea of sending a letter rather than an email is probably ridiculous. And for those that will be voting by 2020, the idea of sending an email rather than an iMessage, a WhatsApp, a Twitter DM, a Snapchat, a BBM, if they still exist by then, or a short message sent through any number of other services, uh, let alone the idea of making an actual phone call, will seem archaic. For the incoming generation of public service consumers, if you can't find it online, buy it online or interact with it online, then as far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. And this goes for the, member, the members of Generation Y as well. Anyone under the age of 30 will have spent their entire adult life with access to the internet. The internet and technology is shaping the way everyone interacts, transacts and reacts, and has been doing so for at least a decade. Well, everyone that is except government. Now, it's always easy to bash government when it comes to technology. After all, the civil servant doesn't have a great track record when it comes to implementing IT projects. Until 2010, what had been lacking was a default mindset around how we use technology to interact and transform processes and the user experience. But with the creation of the government digital service, that has, I think, all changed. Most people think that they've just been tasked with putting a new front end on government-facing websites. And whilst gov.uk has provided a modern look and brought nearly all the government under one roof, 
that isn't GDS's only task, and that isn't the real point of gov.uk. Their other task has been to push forward the digital by default agenda, to use newer, more modern methods of software development, and to improve the user experience when people interact with government. A good example of that is tax disks. The gov.uk site currently contains a beta version of a new tax disk renewal application. It's simple, quick, and attractive. In short, it fulfills the expectations people have about web applications. There's no need to physically present yourself and your papers at a post office, or to post it in a form, to, or, or to post in a form uh, with a check to pay. You just do it all online in three quick steps. And thanks to the deregulation bill, we're even taking away the final paper element and digitizing the entire process. If all goes to plan, then from October, you'll no longer even receive the paper tax disc in the post. Taxing your car will be a purely digital exercise. GDS's successes has shown that transforming consumer-facing services is as much about the right people as it is about the right mindset. Technology skills are vital, and that's why I strongly welcome the new computing GCSEs and the government's focus on technology skills. It's also great to see Policy Exchange picking up on this vital area in their manifesto. There's so much more that you could say in this area in today's uh, discussions. Certainly, you know, how do we ensure the funding stream to create the Silicon Valley beaters? We're very good at first and second round, but we drop off a cliff when it comes to what I would consider third round, five to 20 million. Pound funding? How do we protect IP rights in such a fast changing world? How do we deliver the connectivity infrastructure our businesses and consumers need? But the title of this event is Why Technology Should Be at the Center of the Party's Ideas for 2015. <coughs> for me, it has been because government has to reflect the population it is serving. That population are only going to get more tech savvy have higher expectations from digital public services and have more avenues to communicate their displeasure when we don't reach, let alone exceed, those expectations. Digital isn't going away. However, whoever forms the next government, and I obviously expect us to be the next government, will have no choice but to put tech at the heart of their manifesto. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here today. Um, as uh, Eddie and uh, Nadim indeed have said, uh, this is a very broad, wide-ranging uh, area. And um, I'm very pleased to be asked to speak on it. But as we only have a short amount of time, I shall confine my comments to a small number of areas and um, hope in the wider discussion to bring in perhaps more, more issues. Now, technology and internet in particular have often been hailed as forces for freedom, democracy, and accountability. And let's start by saying that I believe we're not even beginning to see the, all the benefits, to reap all the positive changes that this can bring. And that's why I'm particularly grateful to Policy Exchange for producing this manifesto and raising the issue of technology in manifestos. And I agree with most of their, uh, what they say. There is one major omission, um, which I will uh, mention, um, but I agree with most of what they'll say, and I'm just gonna concentrate on two or three recommendations. I think it is really important to understand how technology will change our lives, the opportunities it is bringing, as well as the challenges that these changes will bring. And it's critical that we don't leave anyone behind. So as the manifesto says, and I quote, Citizens need to be online to ensure that technology does not create a new digital divide. Well, I'm afraid that's too late. <laughs> you know, there is already a digital divide, and it is growing. And right now, I know as an MP and as the, and as the spokesperson on digital government, that many people are also experiencing what I call, and I think I invented the phrase, digital discomfort. 
you know, whether it's the sense that the security services are know who we're calling, whether it's Amazon saying that we should be what we should be buying, whether it's concerns that online porn is too easily accessible, or the feeling that uh, Google is uh, recording our every move, or it's just simply the absolute onslaught of slam, sp slam, spam that happens every time you open your inbox. So the government's abandonment of Labour's universal broadband pledge, their mishandling of broadband rollout, the imposition of digital <coughs> by default as a cost-cutting rather than an enabling and empowering service improvement programme, together with growing economic e inequality, the cost of living crisis and the rise of big data and cloud means that there is a real risk of a large disenfranchised and disempowered underclass developing, whilst the privileged few, uh, or the geek elite, I like to call them, um, enjoy greater freedom and transparency. Now, ministers recently published, after four years in power, this government finally published a digital inclusion strategy about a month ago, which from the beginning says that it's going to leave behind 10% of people. So what kind of inclusion strategy is it that excludes 7 million people from the get-go? And the, the manifesto is right to highlight access in terms of infrastructure and skills as a priority, but as I stand it by Eddie is that you don't mention the gender divide and the fact that this, both in terms of skills and engineers and developers every, in the ICT industry, it's only 16% women is the best figure and that is where our future skills need to be coming from. So there are still 5 million households in this country that have no access to internet and millions more who don't feel confident about it. And we need to um, ensure that we don't leave people on the other side of the digital divide. So, going on from that then, Labour, uh, uh, with regards to data, we recognise the transformative power of technology for society. And we recognise, as the manifesto says, that getting it right is not a case of producing our own version of this document, but about embedding it, technology, in every aspect of our policy development. And that is actually what I'm doing in terms of talking to my colleagues in shadow ministries across um, our shadow government. Um, we have a front bench digital group that meets regularly to discuss these issues made of, uh, of corresponding ministers. And uh, we're talking and listening with a huge range of people as part of our policy development. Um, we've already said that we're going to look at digital crime and make identity theft a specific criminal offence. And more broadly, uh, we have a wide network of experts, Labour Digital, feeding into three digital policy reviews. Um, we have a uh, digital and creative industries review, uh, reporting to Harriet Harman and Chukur Muna, looking at the digital economy and growth opportunities. Maggie Philbin is leading a review into digital skills, she's doing great work, I really um, suggest you look it up. And I'm leading the review into digital government. Now, I'm just going to mention the nine propositions in our digital government review. So if you haven't had the chance to, or you haven't felt able to submit so far, um, submissions are open until the 12th of June. So we're looking at access and skills, information rights, supporting communities, citizen needs, people powered, continuous innovation, digital framework, digital procurement, skills and culture. And as you probably, if you don't do shorthand, didn't have time to get that down, www.digitalgovernmentreview.org.uk or um, ha um, Twitter tag at DigGovReview. So what's most important is not to address all the concerns, as you say, that are raised, raised arise across government ad hoc and reactively. We need a broad and more fundamental debate on the role of technology in society. A huge part of that is about data, who owns it, and who should have access to it. So I'm currently leading the opposition scrutiny of the government's deregulation bill, and we have been putting in place um, with Stella Creasy put down amendments to try and give people ownership of their own data and the right to have access to it. Those amendments were obviously opposed by the government. So finally then, um, I absolutely agree with the recommendation that um, public services which improve, involve personal data should be designed on the presumption <coughs> that the citizen is in control of that data. 
Um, so, used properly, okay, with proper concern for privacy, transparency, and service design, technology can be the powerful tool to reshape how government and citizens interact with each other, as well as to provide economic, social, and cultural opportunities which we cannot um, afford to miss out on. But we do need to establish the principles by which we operate. We need a framework for the relationship between the people, government, and technology. That's the debate that we need to engage in, and I'm grateful to Policy Exchange for highlighting that. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and, and thanks to you and Policy Exchange, and thanks to Google uh, for hosting us. Um, so I'm Julian Hutton, Member of Parliament for Cambridge. Before that, I used to write Perl script, uh, though I never read very much of it because I, I wasn't able to. Um, and so I had that experience of trying to use tech uh, for real. Um, and I was just reflecting. Um, I have the great advantage of so I'm not using a piece of paper. I can, I can search things here. But I thought um, Nadim said essentially, to massively oversimplify, that we should do tech in government because we have to do it. She pointed out many of the problems with what's happening within tech. I think we should do tech because it's fun, because it's worthwhile, because we're better off doing it. Um, and I, I just have a much more positive outlook, I think, about why we should get engaged. It's incredibly important. I have to say, and this is maybe a discussion uh, over a drink at a, at a pub, um, I think technology is fundamentally a fairly liberal area. Um, because it's about creativity, it's about small, dynamic, disruptive organisations, and if one or two big ones, I see Google at the back. Um, <laughs> and the focus being on what you can do, not on one your organisation did previously, not just on having massive merge market shares and then dominating an area, but on being constantly creative, constantly <coughs> updating. Um, but that, as I say, is maybe a discussion later on in a pub. Um, and it's just worth also saying that tech is a lot broader than just digital. And I, and I think there's some issues with the, the manifesto between those. Things like biotech, things like clean tech are also really important, and they are also interlinked. But there are lots of uh, feed throws between all of them. And I should say, of course, I see a lot of this um, having the great pleasure to represent somewhere like Cambridge. We have a population of about 110,000, and we have about 58,000 direct technology jobs. We are a huge importer of tech jobs. It's about 13 billion pounds in revenue. It, was, it really is a very, very sizable contribution. So we have an interest in getting tech right purely to make sure that my constituents and all the neighbouring areas have jobs. Um, and I got involved, one of the first things I did when I was MP, and indeed a bit before that, was to get involved in this era of I, IT policy and to work to have a review within the Liberal Democrats a few years ago. And it slightly came from a fairly bad uh, past. Some of you will remember the Digital Economy Act and some of the issues around some of the changes within that. The way it was rushed through, it had, I think, 35 minutes debate in the House of Commons, very minimal amount, but long enough for uh, a minister to refer to an IP address as an intellectual property address. Uh, now, whatever you think, and there's a genuine debate about how to deal with copyright, I'd like it to be done by people who know what they're talking about. Um, and so, as a result of that, we did a big review, and we spoke probably to many of the same people that everyone else here has been speaking to a few years ago, and produced a policy paper called Preparing the Ground, and some of you I know have seen it, um, and actually a lot of it fits very well. We tried to write it so it wouldn't go out of date, of course much of it has gone out of date, um, but a lot of the principles we set there about who controls data, about so the skills agenda do fit incredibly well, and I do uh, urge people to read it. I think you said you'd kind of look at it and sort of uh, preparing this. Um, and it covers everything, it covers bits about people, we have to have people with the skills to do all of this, we need to make sure there's a business environment that encourages businesses to try things, to take the risks that will lead to the new breakthroughs and to have the security that they need and of course to make sure we have that infrastructure that we don't have so many places even around Cambridge that simply cannot got, get sensible connectivity. And it permeates literally everything that we do. One of the reasons why Addison Lee have managed to be a very successful company in London is because they use a fantastic piece of technology using intelligent agent modelling and so they can far more efficiently dispatch vehicles around. Why aren't we taking that and applying it to the railways. We currently take months and months and months to find new rail paths, and why it always takes so long. It could be done automatically. It would also mean that when your train breaks down, you're not left waiting for one of the three people in the control room to move a little logo to say that your train can move. It affects, obviously, everything to do with business and uh, the creative industries, the business-to-business -business work, all of that sort of thing. 
Opening up data, we can do much more to get more people to contribute to government making decisions rather than civil servants being the only people who have access to information. It is possible for people in this room to change what's going to happen. And of course, foreign affairs, the whole world is being changed completely by the fact that people can now communicate very, very quickly and easily. It's hard for an incident to happen in almost anywhere in the world, Russia, Ukraine, without everyone being instantly available. And I thought this report was really very good. Um, it had a number of things which were non-controversial. They're just really about prioritization, all the stuff about government, digital by default, a lot of the things there are just, do you actually take it seriously? Nobody's going to argue we shouldn't invest in infrastructure. It's a question of whether you bother to actually do it. Some of it is obvious but rather belated, like all the stuff about skills training. You know, it is astonishing that we are still teaching people how to use Microsoft Word, how to use Microsoft Excel, rather than how to program. I'm really pleased that we're going through that change and, and that organisations such as Raspberry Pi have made such a difference in that. Um, there's a lot there we do need to do to close much of the digital by Chi is absolutely right on that. Uh, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity. There are also ideas about inclusive design. That anything we can do to make the internet easier to use for old people who are not very good at using the internet probably makes it easier for all the rest of us to use it. Not all of us use command line interfaces, even though they're powerful, because it's nicer to do other things. Um, it's also obvious that we all want to support business, but we have to make sure that there is funding there at every stage to try something initially, to build it, to make sure you have the capacity to go into a bigger uh, company as well, and to make sure that we don't change regulations constantly, that we don't have chopping and changing like Google faced recently with the ECJ judgment about the right to be forgotten. If we keep changing the rules, you will all struggle to keep pace rather than being creative. There's also a few controversial things I just want to say I was really pleased to see for example, an education-first approach to internet safety. That is absolutely correct, something that I and my colleagues have been arguing for, and both Labour and the Conservatives have argued for a regulation-first approach, banning things rather than teaching people to be sensible. Uh, and concerns about website blocking, all of that, we've seen that with uh, also things like the uh, proposed communications data bill. Um, also, please see things about open data with the ordnance survey data, about should we go further with Met Office, should we go further with the postcode address files, so that people can do things. I want to finish with two quick thoughts. One is about a tough conceptual thing, which is about that data control issue. And I'm really pleased to see that it reiterates what we said in our paper, which is that you have to make sure that it is the citizen who is in control of their data. It should be easy to share your own data. You shouldn't have problems about, data, about that. But it should be easy to stop sharing that data as well uh, when you want to. And people like MyDex and the whole My Data program are doing really well. And hopefully that will avoid many of the problems we're having. The last thing I just want to say, I started off by saying I think that the whole idea of the tech sector is fundamentally a liberal thing. You may or may not agree with me. What I would also say is that across all the parties, there are a handful of MPs, but only a handful, who really get it. The vast majority of MPs simply do not get it. Now, whatever your own personal preferences are, I would suggest that you work in your own self-interests and try to make sure that people who get it, whatever party they're from, get back into Parliament. If you apply a selective pressure, we will evolve. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to each of our panellists. And I must apologise in my haste to welcome you all. I neglected to say a particular thank you to our two sponsors today. And that is Google and EMC, uh, both represented in this room today, both with very strong, diverse, interesting views on tech and data do make sure you get a chance to talk to them at the end, should you wish to. Anyway, we have just heard uh, three uh, contrasting views um, of what tech and data can do. I'm going to abuse my position with the microphone just to launch with one question, and then I will open it up to the floor. So please be ready on the themes of the tech economy, on the connected society, digital government, open data, all the key themes that we've just heard now. Um, I'll be taking questions in one moment. If I may start, though, uh, with asking, as we are sitting here in Google campus, and when parties of all colours have said that the tech economy is really important and Britain could be really good at this, from Newcastle to Cambridge to London and beyond, um, what do you think needs to happen next uh, to support the tech sector in this country? Should we start in reverse order? Can we start with Julian? <laughs> <laughs> with the least time to think about it. I think part of it is about celebrating the tech sector, and part of it is what I tried to touch on earlier, 
that we need to make sure that there are the people in place. I didn't have time to talk about the immigration issues. We should make sure that when we get skilled people to come here to study, for example, we let them stay to contribute to that sector. Make it easier for entrepreneurs who have a brilliant idea. You know, when you need that particular person with that skill set to get the people here. We need to make sure there's money available. And I'm really quite excited about small scale pots of money to try things. So there's something that, used to, that uh, I think Labour set up called the um, DTI Smart Awards. I set up a small biotech company, uh, which won one of those, but was otherwise a complete failure. Um, and it was brilliant because it enabled us uh, to try something that didn't work. But we tried it. We learned a lot. We moved on. Having that sort of pot of money, it was then abolished a few years later. It's now been brought back in by this government. Um, but having that sort of thing is, is really key. We also need to get more business angels, more of the tech sector area. I'd like to see more change in R&D tax credit so it is easier to get that for tech because there's a really nasty dividing line where people can fall uh, foul of it. Um, and to make sure there's space for people to try things out, that people can get around um, and do that. But of course, that could be done more virtually and you can save quite a lot of carbon emissions that way. Thank you, Chief. Uh, well, there's a lot of things that need to happen, but hey, I will focus yeah. on Sorry. one Stop. thing, um, which is... Um, um, with Julian's alluded to briefly, which is about celebrating tech and technology. Because a lot of the things that we want to include in terms of increased skills, in terms of actually more knowledgeable in patient finance for tech and for tech failure as well, um, all that is more likely to happen in a culture which embraces, celebrates, and supports technology. And so, um, what, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today is that we need technologists, tech, techies who are more willing to stand up, shout up, shout out about the value of technology. And just one of the things, one of the, um, one of the, one of the things that happened in the last, um, in the last election in the government was that the lobby, if you like, for content was much stronger and much more vocal than the lobby for technology. And uh, I have one um, tech person who counted to me, you know, the story that, you know, the content people would turn up and invite MPs and civil servants to the Harry Potter um, you know, film set or something like that. The tech people would invite them to data farms. Now, I actually love that. You know, you can invite anyone and invite me. I'd be very pleased to do so. But the interesting thing is, a photograph of an MP yeah, surrounded by technology is much more likely to go on a leaflet than one of them be going around a film set because they know that that's where the jobs are. So there is you know, a real potential to effectively, more effectively, lobby Parliament. But you're just, you're, we are just not making use of all our attributes. So do that. Thank you, Chief. I think um, I'm going to be greedy enough for two things uh, to happen. <laughs> okay. uh, the, first, the first of which is do not inside government think you can do everything inside of government. When I was running UCO, um, uh, Stephen Shakespeare and I were invited to see one of the departments of government, which will remain nameless. Um, it was under a previous administration, but um, that I will not make that, that political point. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we, there. <laughs> we went to this meeting. Directly. <laughs> we went to this meeting, and uh, what was uh, put in front of us, and the question to us was, could we do the research to back this up? was that this department wanted to build its own bespoke search engine. Uh, because they had a, a government, uh, you know, had a departmental underspend, and they wanted to spend more money. And we both sort of, you know, we think, well, you know, do we sort of try, try and take the, the business and do the research, and we tell them, actually, you know, how about talking to Google? Or talking to someone else um, that can do this stuff much better than you can do inside of government. So don't do things that you're not good at. Uh, there's lots of great innovative businesses, and let's encourage more of them. The second thing is, if in the next parliament, where I hope we are in government, if I can come back here and say to you that we are equal to, or hopefully ahead of Silicon Valley, in what I talked about, that sort of, that crucial sort of third and fourth round of funding to keep us in the UK, and that's a combination. It's not just about facilitating the funding. Uh, it's also about a cultural shift. You know, far too many of our entrepreneurs sell out too early. You know, there's a sort of, there's, there's this sort of story someone told me the other day, you know, when an American builds a business, they sell it, and within weeks they've started their next business uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, in in, in uh, uh, the UK, you know, they, they sell the business, they think about a house in the Algarve and playing golf. In Germany, they never sell the business, they just hand it down from generation to generation. So there's a cultural element to this as well as a financial one. 
Thank you very much. Right, we will um, head to um, the floor. Can I ask you all, similarly as our panellists have done, keep your points and questions uh, brief. I don't think we can start pulling uh, from this topic, perhaps with the tech sector, tech industry, uh, what businesses need. We'll move on through these different themes, but any initial questions on that theme? I'll probably take two in a row. You, sir, and uh, <coughs> uh, we've got microphones going around. All right, David Wood, London Futures. Which of the politicians here want to put the technology front and centre has stated in this manifesto that do it in a more serious way, investing in the technologies that are likely to make a key difference in the next 10 years, whether it's uh, regenerative medicine, building on the stem cell capabilities of the uh, universities around here, whether it's the green tech, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, there's so many technologies which will be very significant. I'm surprised, in fact, that there's nothing in this manifesto <coughs> to say that the politicians should be helping to lead and support. Maybe the view is that this is not for politicians. Maybe politicians should just get out of the way. What's your view? Actually, well, we'll start with that question in isolation because that's quite specific. Who would... Uh, Gene, would you like to start? Um, I'll, say that, uh, I'll say two things to that. Firstly, um, politicians, by which you mean the public, like people, citizens, have invested in some of the most important technologies. <coughs> I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Ariana Mazzucatu's work, which shows the proportion of an iPhone which comes from public sector investment. And secondly, that the, um, well, they're called now the catapults. I hate that name, but I won't make a political <laughs> um, but that which were the idea, an idea of the last uh, government, which are now in place to do exactly that, to take some of that, to take some of those um, technologies and help commercialise them. Now you can discuss and debate the, uh, the amount that should be invested and the long termism of that investment. But I think you know, we certainly that is a that is a policy plan which all, I think all parties are committed to supporting. Living the old Julian, do you want to come? Happy to come in. I mean, I, I think. You raise an important point. Um, I'd like us to look at ideas like innovation bonds, uh, uh, for example. I think it's you know, there's so much happening between universities and um, uh, academia, academic research. But I think we can get better at doing it. The Americans actually do very well. So I've seen examples out of Silicon Valley where uh, not only has the government been an investor, but pension funds uh, are allowed to invest in higher risk investments uh, in, across America, uh, but they also then become the buyers of the product, or at least the, 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 in the trial period, certainly uh, Department of Defense and other departments. And that's a great thing for a startup, a great thing for a, for a business uh, a startup to be able to say to other customers, look, you know, my product's being bought by my government as well. So uh, more of that in the UK would be great. Anything to say, Julian? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, first, I think this is actually an existential question. You know, how will Britain earn its way in 2050? What is it we're going to do to have the rest of the world send money to let us have a good quality of life? And I can't see what it is if it's not about new technologies, new things, like, like the long list you were talking about. I don't know what it's going to be. We're not going to become the great agricultural powerhouse of the world. We're not going to become, you know, the, the sort of vast manufacturing cell. I just can't see it being us. It has to be around these tech things. It's something we have to prioritise. Um, I spoke earlier about my the IT policy paper that I showed. I actually also did one on science and research policy, which uh, if you haven't seen, I'd be very happy to send it to you. I, 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 I'm vice chair of our federal <coughs> policy council, so I do tend to write various of these things. Um, and one of the things that says that we have to uh, invest much more in these areas. So we've called for a 3% increase in uh, science research funding from government for a sustained period of 15 years if we can get agreement from the other two parties. I haven't yet had that agreement. I'm, you know, I'd love to get it because we have to do that investment so that we will be able to enable things later. Uh, there's lots of research, so you get a strong crowding in effect. As government puts money into these areas, it doesn't drive private investment out, it pulls much, much more in. So it's a really incredibly good thing to do. There's lots of specific policies about that to do with angel co-investment and the funds set up there to make it easier, um, to make the university links with IP much, much simpler. Um, but I think one of the other things is this idea that Dean touched on about having an initial purchaser. And there's quite a lot of research which shows that uh, startups which have a customer are far more successful, far more quickly. And so things like SBRI, being <coughs> expanded, are really critical to getting that going. But in all of these areas, we have to do it. We have to get the people, the money, the skills, the excitement, the initiative. Thank you. Uh, did James have yeah. James got the microphone at the back? So James Passer from EMC. Um, so my question is really around cost efficiency and how we can deliver better public services. Now, in the report, it says there are 24 billion. Uh, pound prize by 2020. 
um, which I would actually call, say would be undercalling it. Um, and in the last four years, we've seen some good progress, but I would say it's in islands. Um, how does the, what does the panel think needs to be done to truly accelerate the innovation and the potential cost savings that can be achieved more quickly, um, particularly over the next government term? Nadine, do you want to go? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think build on what um, uh, Dave Young's been doing. So Lord Young um, you know, actually made it his sort of passion, his, his, his focus to get more SMEs to uh, be able to supply government. Uh, and certainly in the tech sector, you know, he's shared examples with me where you know, SMEs have been able to come in and don't have the, sort of the, 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 the barriers that were put in the way before where you'd have five or seven years of accounts and all, all sorts of other things. Um, and have been able to deliver projects for government at you know, a tenth of the price um, that they were being procured at from very large uh, providers. Um, and I think the other area is, is just thinking about the capabilities within government. And you know, you're, you're certainly getting a, you know, a now sort of fresh thinking about actually making people specialists rather than generalists. You know, the civil service is fantastic and very, very strong and gets you know, um, so sort of headhunted from around the world um, when we let people go from our own uh, government. But in many cases, people tend to be far more generalists rather than, than specialists in different areas. And I think that would also help uh, begin to move the dial in terms of efficiency within the government. Okay, can I move to Chi? Because Chi, you specifically mentioned a sort of a critical um, a comment towards the current <coughs> government focusing too much on cost savings, but where do you see things well, from this perspective? Well, I mean, the, our digital government review is um, addressing that question as well as how we change public service, public di digital services. So, as I said, it's a wide-ranging review, and I would, you would be quite annoyed at me if I had to take up the, next, the whole next half hour in saying all the evidence we've had so far. But uh, two things. Um, one of the thing, one, three things actually. Firstly, you've got to empower and give the skills to the frontline civil servants. Now we have de-skilled the civil service. We have de-skilled many of the procurement. We've outsourced much of our, we've outsourced both the procurement and the delivery of services at times. And so we need to give them the skills and, and the um, the infrastructure to be able to do this more effectively. I think it requires something much more, if you like, radical um, than than what GDS have been doing. GDS have done made great progress, but it needs to be cross-governmental and also cross-local and national <coughs> local and national government. And that's why we're having um, very interesting debates about the kind of national and local <coughs> infrastructure you need and able to support that. So that's skilling the civil service. That's also skilling up the um, the users, so you have co-producing services because then you have you have cost savings as well as improved services and then uh, just uh, just just finally on that point does anyone here programming COBOL? didn't think so well my view uh, well, one, well you have a pension uh, if you don't have a pension plan you have a real opportunity coming up in about 2017 because one of the ways that this government has been supposedly making savings is by putting off the replacement for many of the big systems which are COBOL based and, but, and, and, and there is no strategy to how to extend them because we haven't got an agreed local and national uh, digital infrastructure. So come 2017, you're probably going to be able to name your own price uh, to uh, program in COBOL um, unless we get into COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds to me like a reason not to vote Labour, but I don't think... <laughs> 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 I, give, give, give them a <laughs> I just actually want to... I mean, I think there are lots of areas where you can find cost savings. One of the key things I'd add to what's been said is to make use of enthusiastic people who just want to do things for, for the interest. That's something which technology enables that would be very hard to do before. And I just want to give you a slightly parochial example. It's one I, I find quite interesting. Um, cycle route finding is a, is a challenge. How do you best cycle from A to B? Probably doesn't mean taking the main roads. You care more about hills than you do if you're driving. Um, and there was a Department of Transport, this was probably five or six years ago, um, hired some people to do the work. And for about 2.4 million, they built a really, you know, good finder. A couple of guys in Cambridge who were involved in the Cambridge cycling campaign 
set up a nice little algorithm that does it. Cost them a total of £10,000 to get it done. Mm. Because they really, really cared, they didn't have to go and find cyclists to ask what they wanted. They knew what they wanted. They built it up. They've now got another 30000 They've been able to cover the entire country very, very quickly and easily. It's available as an app. It's a fantastic thing. If you make use of people who will do things for little money because they really care, you can do that. That doesn't apply for everything. I wouldn't say, you know, DWP, does anybody really care about the entirety of DWP? Please go and do it. But there are lots of places, there are lots of places where you could either provide new services that just simply people didn't think to want, um, or find better ways of doing them just by using that creativity as well. Okay, thank you. Some more questions, please. Uh, from Charlotte from this corner and Guy from this corner. If you can both ask questions and then um, I'll give them the opportunity to respond after both. Yeah, no problem. Hi, I'm Charlotte from Computer World. Um, very interesting. Uh, interesting to, I agree with a lot of what you say to you. I'm, I'm slightly concerned, though, by some of the talk around digital exclusion. And it's an issue that we need to worry about a lot. However, given that 90% of the UK population are online and they expect excellent services, which are convenient, which work first time, I worry that the focus, that perhaps it needs, there needs to be a sense of perspective about that. Um, and I wanted to ask directly, I know you're still doing your review. Mm. Would Labour uh, keep the government digital service? Okay, <laughs> one more question, and then we'll allow you to answer both. We'll start with Chief. Great, I'm going to ask you something that everyone's touched upon. Uh, I think there's lots of great work going on with code clubs and with UNCO and coding schools and all these brilliant initiatives to create the next generation of developers and coders. In the short term, though, all the startups I to talk to talk about immigration as a barrier to skills, talent. Uh, so I want to ask what you think your parties should be doing on, on immigration and what impact, if any, you think recent election results and political trends may, may have on or how on that. Okay, can we go to Chi first to answer that first question? Yes, um, it's interesting um, where you're saying yeah. that perhaps too much emphasis on digital inclusion. You know, one of the, diff one of the key differences, and uh, it was a point I tried to make again and again, <coughs> between the private sector and the public sector that I believe, that probably indeed, and um, Julian don't, don't believe in is that the public sector cannot choose its market. The public sector is 100%. It cannot um, exclude part of its market. It cannot go for a certain demographic. It needs to be for everybody. And I believe that being a citizen in the future requires digital skills that we're just as being a citizen now requires the ability to be like to read or write and to engage. So I don't believe it's possible to put too much emphasis on digital inclusion because if we don't have, we will, we will, you know, digital, digital government without digital inclusion is a return to an 18th century model of democracy amongst a small elite. And what about Labour's attitude towards GDS? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, and and that doesn't. Let me finish. That doesn't mean that services don't need to be good. And they need to be excellent. But most of the cost. In, in, in public services are not the sort of things like renewing your driving license, they are the really <coughs> complex services which are usually, which are more interacted with the lower, um, the most vulnerable and uh, pop population. Um, GDS, every, you know, everything we have said in the review has made it clear that we need the work that GDS is doing, that we will build on the work that GDS is doing. And if it isn't, if GDS didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent something very like them. Now, I haven't finished the review, and neither has my colleague Michael Duggar, who was looking at public uh, civil servant service reform. So I can't tell you what the structure of the civil service would be in the next government, and what would, would be where. But certainly in terms of having that skill set, and that, there's so much transformation going to be needed. As the next government should be a government of digital government, uh, that those skills and that um, kind of approach of excellence will certainly be required. Okay, thank you. Julian, can I come to you on the skills and immigration question? Yeah. Cambridge clearly a massive draw for that kind of talent. What's your perspective? I, I mean, yes, can I just pick up on that? I mean, we would definitely want to keep GDS going because while you have to have inclusion, you also want really good services for people who are online. My, my mother's registered blind. She doesn't get upset if there's a really simple, clear form that other people can use. Um, you know, there has to be something for, for her as well. Um, so, you know, I think it's fantastic, but we can do much more. I don't think anybody thinks GDS is, is the end. We stop now. Um, your question is absolutely key. Um, and it is really, really terrifying 
um, how much rhetoric there is against immigration, against foreigners, to our massive, massive detriment. Um, it was driven, I mean, we, we've seen a whole series of things driving it. Um, Theresa May and Doe Cameron's thing about reducing immigration to the tens of thousands, regardless of the economic impact, is a perverse thing to do. Um, and I think it is causing harm. I'm very pleased they haven't managed to do it. I'm disappointed Labour's reaction has been you haven't cut immigration fast enough. Um, we desperately have to get skilled people here. You can either train people locally, which takes years. If you start off training a seven-year-old, they're not going to be employable for quite a long time, I'm quite pleased to say. Um, we have to be able to attract people from overseas. We should have a positive immigration. We should close down loopholes which allow people to cheat. Absolutely. We should reintroduce exit checks. We should have a, a borders agency now, the Home Office, that is competent, which would be quite a step forward. Um, but we should have policies which get skilled people here, don't put barriers in their way, don't tear families away. We are losing people. I know in Cambridge have many examples of fantastic people who are driven away because their partner can't come here, or their parents can't come from China to visit them. Whatever it is, it's costing us. It's really, really hard. Yes, there's a rise of UKIP. What we're seeing is both Conservative and Labour chasing that uh, in a very, very painful way. Uh, your, part, your party is in a government and, 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 introducing and, these policies. And, 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 and we, have dis we, have, we have disagreed with a lot of it. We've <laughs> but got you haven't voted against any no, of it. We've got a lot of the things that they were suggested. For example, family migration cap of 25,000. We said that is completely unacceptable and got it changed. Um, and it is a shame that Labour got to the stage where the NUS passed a formal vote saying that Labour should stop chasing the anti-immigration rhetoric. When you get to the stage where, where the NUS is slamming you for that, you should be quite careful. Okay, there's no more about the NUS slamming, slamming you for your appointment. Sorry, they've received some good questions. Can we take that? I can see a hand up. Yes, Chris, I've got to turn that back. I can see uh, and this gentleman just here. So, yeah. Philip then Chris. Yeah. Okay, uh, Philip Virgo as the only cobalt programmer <laughs> in the world. <laughs> um, skilled shortages have been with us since I entered the industry in '68. They go round and round and round. Everybody admires them. Nobody actually does anything about them. When are we going to do something to make it actually more economic for employers to train people from scratch, as I was? or to cross-train people than to go out and try and hire people ready trained, including from overseas. Because it does not take that long to take people from scratch and get them productive, and then you upgrade their skills over time, but we don't do it. Okay, so <coughs> thank you. So, and uh, Charles? Yeah. Um, the subject, I'm Charles, um, the subject of education is being touched on. Uh, and you know the policy framework goes until 2020. We should be thinking now about uh, our citizens in 2035, 2040, and start to educate people in <coughs> primary level, junior level, secondary level, and so on, or we will not see the changes that we want to see made. And I, I'd like to hear the panel's views on that. So the question of skills, both in the workplace and for the long term, Nadine. I, mean, I think actually both Philip and, and Charles, and back to Guy's question, which I just want to come back on a little bit, um, uh, and to push back on, on what Julian was saying, you know, it's not a trade off. It, it, this isn't about us sort of you know, closing our, our borders or completely having them open and out of control. It's about, first of all, I think the reason that this government, yes, my party, took the position to do, had a target because. In any organization that I've been involved in before coming into politics, you set targets so the organization begins to know where you're heading to. And that's why they're important. Uh, but actually, what it's about is regaining the confidence and the goodwill of the British people. Because when, when people see that actually their government is just not responding to their concerns that they, that they see, it's not immigration as such, it's the speed at which it was going at that people. When you look at the, the data, when you look at the research, that's where I would take issue with, with Julia. It's far too simplistic to get capped by a headline and say, you know, everything this government is doing is really bad. Actually, it's not. When you talk to people, you see, you know, and I'm, I'm on the BIS Select Committee and we travel with the committee, you talk to UKTI and so on. You know, people understand that actually this country is great to come to, to research. Uh, you know, Russell's universities are doing really well in, in, in attracting uh, very bright people to come and, and, and study here. Uh, in the UK. But the important bit is to have the credibility in the first place. To get that credibility, we've had to do some dramatic things. 
and again, without wanting to sort of get into party politics, the reason was when we came to office, you know, it was an open door policy. That we're changing, I'm not going to rehash all that. But going back to the points, okay, so going, 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 back, going back to the point that, that, that the Philip and Charles, an open door when you had it, it was completely, you don't take my word for it, Jack Straw put his hand up in Parliament and said, we made a mistake, we got it wrong. You know, we thought we were going to get a few thousand, it was 700,000. Okay, okay. so what's, what's this question of skills? Not something from a man. What do we do internally? Right, in skills, you know, that's what Hancock is trying to do. We set ourselves a target of two million apprentices. Um, you look at what's happening around the incentive on national insurance payments for, for young people up to 21 years old. That, I think, is beginning to get people to actually hire um, young people and invest in them and actually get them trained up. When I was hiring people at YouGov, I didn't really look at what skill sets they had because I knew once they come in, they're going to have to learn something new because it's the way we did it. We were new. We were disrupting the market. So I absolutely share your view, and I think that this government, certainly the Conserve half of it, is passionate about this stuff. Chief, so digital skills. Uh, well, I will come back to immigration because I, I, I just think that, that Julian pretending his party is not a member of this government, I know they're trying to decide, to distance themselves as the election approaches, but it's clearly the Liberal Democrat Conservative government which has introduced these policies to do uh, with, um, with regard to immigration and regard to particularly on skills, which is causing many, so many um, problems for many companies. But I'd also say that um, the key issue, because it, it, yeah, it, it, one of the key issues is about the downward pressure on wages and salaries that many of my constituents are experiencing, partially as a consequence of the um, cost of living crisis, but also because they are competing the wage, with wage, the, 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 We are in favour of strengthening the minimum wage. But, well, no, not in favour, but still, but do you, you really want to go about agency workers and how the minimum wage is not effectively paid and how the number of, of inspectors for the minimum wage payments have been drastically reduced on, under this government and so there's hardly been any, any um, prosecutions. So at the low end of the skill sector, maybe very well in, you know, it, um, for, I haven't seen the figures recently, but I take it that the salaries for, for, for um, developers and engineers have increased more than those for construction workers in Newcastle. For example, so on digital skills um, specifically, then um, and, and this is where uh, we talked about, about there's much to be done, but the addressing the gender divide. When I went to Imperial in uh, 1984, um, there was 10% of the women on my course studying electrical engineering were women. Now it's exactly that. I think it might be 12%. 25 years and it hasn't budged. And wherever else, you know, if you look at medicine, if you look at law, if you look at accountancy, you know, apart from, I think, construction, um, the engineering tech is the least gender balanced um, sector. And we are losing out a huge amount on the potential skills. And let me say also, just quickly, it's not the case in India, it's not the case in China, it's not the case in Nigeria. It is in the UK, and the UK is the worst country in Europe but it is also the case across Europe. Okay, so we thank you. So I'm conscious that. of time. So Julian, right of rebuttal on that uh, previous point, but also um, to uh, Charles's point on long-term skills. What's um, that? I mean, happy to do the right of rebuttal, but I suspect people have had enough of it already. So um, I'll, I'll move on, and you know, if we make it to the bar at some point. Um, the skills thing about hiring, hiring from scratch. You know, yes, absolutely. You should. Uh, Organisations should do that. And the work on apprenticeships, for example, the UTCs. There's a lot more in that space that can be done. I, I opened a new. Uh, site at the Cambridge Regional College just recently. Um, so, th you know, that's a shared agenda, that's very clear. Vince Cable's been doing a lot of work on getting those apprenticeships. It's fantastic. It's really upsetting to me, actually, that for so many years, the thing that was prized was a university degree, yeah. not skills to actually do things. There was this bizarre Blairite, you know, 50% must go to university, not so worried about the vocational side of it. A huge increase in apprenticeships is, 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 is really very welcome. But it, and yes, so you can take people who are ready to be trained from scratch. You will need more people than that. You can then also take people who are children at the moment and train them, and we need to do that, yeah. but that takes a lot of time. So you'll also have to get people yeah. from overseas. And also in a lot of these tech areas, Britain will never be the best area for every single aspect of all technologies. It's just not going to happen. So there'll always be a time where you need that person who's done graphic design experience in that particular area, and they happen to be there. You know, we won't have all of those people here locally. Um, so you know, we need to do much more of all of that. 
Um, to say to Charles, yes, education is fundamentally important, since it's you, I'd say, in the rest of the world as well as here. But, um, uh, but we do have to do much more, and to really start thinking about how young people will learn. Um, I, I think we are making progress there. You know, as I said, with things like the Raspberry Pi, with things like actually teaching people to code at school. And I've been to schools and seen people play with it and realise the fun of, of coding stuff not just of using a computer. Okay, let's have get to have, some we have to have tuning. Can I just say one thing? Perhaps the debate upon, of mice and men shouldn't be computer-oriented. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> lady here and gentleman at the front, please. And uh, if I can ask for super, super snappy Sorry. responses. We've only got 10 minutes left, so yes. Hi, I'm Helen Mullen from Tinder Foundation. I was delighted to see that recommendation one is that we shouldn't be um, lacking our ambition, as as she said, we shouldn't go with the government's digital inclusion strategy and leave 10% of the population behind. If you don't believe in the social benefits, the economic benefits are huge. The cost is only going to be around 50 million a year, but the benefits are 1.7 billion a year. She's had a good chance, and she, she's spoke about it well in her speech. I wonder what um, Nadine and Julian think about it too. Okay, we'll put that question to them. Gentlemen at the front. Uh, it's Anne from the World's Physical Society. Uh, as the manifesto suggests, there's a lot of potential gains to be made from data sharing within government, and that's something that in an age of austerity could be done relatively cheaply. As we've seen from the care.data fiasco, uh, where they tried to slip this through without really engaging the public in it, uh, there's a real concern for privacy safeguards. I mean, from our perspective, you can marry the two, strong data sharing and strong privacy safeguards, but where do you all sit on this? Okay, two great questions. So first to Nadim and Julian, and let's start with Nadim on the digital inclusion. Is it important to get everyone online? If not, why? No, absolutely it is. And I think, you know, it's, it's, again, I'm going to use a phrase I used earlier, it's not a trade-off. It's not saying, you know, let's just focus on the 90%, let's ignore um, the people who you know, do find it challenging. Uh, uh, she referred to the people who, you know, who, who are a bit, in many ways, frightened of technology um, and how you get them to, to sort of cross that, that line and, and actually get them engaged. And may not necessarily get them fully engaged in it, but, there are, but, but that doesn't mean you don't do the other bits of it. Um, on the, the, the data sharing, absolutely um, uh, you know, essential in terms of um, what I think future government should look like. Uh, my co-founding colleague, Sam Shakespeare, who uh, authored the Shakespeare Review, which I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, talks about and, and believes passionately in, you know, the citizens should be at the heart of all the data that's collected about them. You know, if whatever government collects, you should be able to see and own and be able to give consent of how it works. And therefore, that's how you, you know, carry the goodwill of the British people with you, so that we avoid uh, issues that, that then um, delay the, the process of data sharing. Okay, thank you. Julian, on digital inclusion first. Um, yeah, of course it's really important. I, I thought I'd touch on it a bit. And in fact, there's a whole section in the paper that we wrote a few years ago about it with some ideas on how to do it, which also includes using phones, because actually there's huge penetrance of mobile phones, um, particularly, uh, interestingly, certainly figures at the time were on social class E, if you believe in social class labels at all. Um, which means you need to think, for some services, can they provide it, can there be a stripped down version which can be used on all sorts of mobile phones, not just smartphones? Can we think a bit more creatively about that? We have to make sure people get here, we simply cannot leave people around. That will involve some creativity, and I do think this idea um, is also that if you make things that are easier for people who aren't comfortable with the internet, it will also be easier for many of us who cope with quite awkward things because we can. Um, so, I, so I think that's what, the care.data question is absolutely uh, really important, and that was a complete and utter fiasco. Um, I think the sad thing about it is that if people had been educated and said, would you be happy to do this, a huge number of people said, yes, I'm quite happy because I can see the medical benefits. And it's because people weren't given that choice that a lot of people reacted uh, very negatively. Um, there is a real question about how we get privacy, whether it's in this sort of area, whether it's broader issues about surveillance, which is a, another subject. Um, how do we actually get that to work? And I think the principle of people having control of their data is the right one. I think you can set up systems such that I can choose to allow you to share data with somebody else, and I can reverse that later. And if, we have, if I have that control, then I'm, if I'm prepared to trust you, I will do that. And then if I say, actually, I now don't trust you, 
I, I can withdraw that personally. Okay, and so Chi on data, did I read a vlog where you said you'd opted out of care dog data? Um, I, you did, and in fact, I'm going to have another vlog tomorrow, I think. Um, <coughs> have you opted out? <laughs> <in? laughs> um, I opted out of care dot data because back in, before it was withdrawn or pulled <coughs> by this government uh, back in March, because though I think that data sharing, and let us distinguish, we don't, this government doesn't, between open data and data sharing. Very important. And open data, we do a lot on in the, in the postcodes, etc. Data sharing, we also need to do a lot on. And um, I think that data sharing gives huge um, opportunities. Um, but it has to be done with consent and informed consent. We have gone past the days when pe when you could just assume that people were, um, they were doing things, the government did things in people's interest, and I'm sure you know, Nadim and, and Julian would agree with me on that. And if people decide that they don't want to share, <coughs> then they have to be allowed not to share, even if it does mess up some of the long-term um, you know, conclusions that we can draw. Now, I, I actually think, and the data, the government review is looking at this, that there is going to be a new job spec for data protectors and data and data anonymizers, you know, or data depersonalizers, or, you know, to help ensure that people's data, as far as possible, cannot be re-identified. Okay, last five. Thank you. Sorry to cut you short. Last five minutes. Let's go for last three hands. I'm afraid that's all we're going to have time for in a row. Uh, uh, Paul here at the front, uh, gentleman over there, and lady in green at the back. Hi, uh, Paul Morris from Spotify. Um, it, it may be uh, intentional, but I noticed that the mobile internet is not directly mentioned in this report. I mean, it's mentioned by you guys a little bit. Um, should we be mentioning it in specifically? Because it still doesn't have the new. It's a bit, it's, if I think about this, it's basically there's lots of debates we've had on most of these issues for some time. The new thing now is actually how we're using the internet and a lot of that is mobility. Mm. Should we be thinking about that more? Uh, about how we can solve some of these issues, including things like digital devices. I do think the mobile internet can play a bigger part in that in the future. So should the mobile internet be pulled out a bit more uh, until we can get to the point where we can combine it with, with the old fashioned bit internet again? That's EE doing that. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, so we're close to the middle of point two. Sorry, gentlemen, just inside here. I'm Martin Beach, Friday G. Um, Might have to speak up relatively loud. So oh, it's Martin Beach, my DJ. I know it's a ticklish question given the host today, but could you tell us how you plan to fix the disconnect between attracting the internet and technology giants to the UK and the fact that they get they pay relatively micro payments in tax in return? Sorry, it's not tax. Make good with high tax. Ah. <laughs> it's a less polite version. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so question on tax, and then the lady at the back of the green. Hi, Michael Tenning, Civil Engineering and Transit Association. I'm not just building and maintaining the Bath of the UK's public infrastructure. Just a quick question on connectivity. Um, I noticed in the manifesto um, from the policy exchange today, um, that's um, one of the questions about broadband speeds, um, on the project about broadband speeds. Is there anything that could be done to um, that government can do to increase um, access um, to super fast broadband for temporary construction sites because there's a um, new uh, scheme going on quite well now called business information modelling and that, um, if used effectively, um, make construction a lot cheaper, more efficient, more effective, but it takes a lot of bandwidth and those on site need it to progress and do their work. So is there anything that can be done to speed up connection times? Okay, so we've got questions on, uh, if anyone didn't hear those, on uh, the themes of mobile internet, um, on taxation, and also on increasing access uh, to super fast broadband. I think we can make these your closing remarks. Uh, we'll go in the same order that we began, so Nadine, uh, final um, remarks. Let, let me take the, the taxation one first. I think, you know, if, if we're going to act, we have to act in concert, i.e. at you know, G20 or larger uh, platforms because that, you know, that's the only way you're going to be able to you know, effectively make something work um, because all you will do then is just you know, actually displace that uh, business to another uh, uh, country. But why say if we're going to act? Surely you have to act. We're absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you're quite right. My, my point is that we have to act together. Um, uh, on mobile, I think I sort of picked up on it. 
in, in what I was saying, I've spoken at other platforms on this. I think it's absolutely crucial. Uh, and, I, and again, you know, what is government's role within that? I think it's, it is about delivering the infrastructure and letting you know, yeah, yeah, innovators innovate, whether they just happen to be passionate because they care or they want to set up a startup and actually do it because they care and want to make money out of it. Um, your last point on construction sites, I will come back to you on that. If you can give me your details, I'll find out. Although it's good news that the Queen's Speech Day, uh, the government announced, I think, 790 million pounds investment in uh, broadband infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Chi? Government did not announce 790 well, million well, pounds the Queen, investment Queen's speech. In, in broadband infrastructure. Um, so, um, just on the tax thing, I, I, I think <coughs> saying that we have to act in concert is often an excuse for not acting because you have, you're waiting until everybody agrees on something. There is much that we can do to encourage and support what we call responsible capitalism, which is certainly about returning to the society and the economic infrastructure which supports uh, employees, citizens, research, investment, um, the taxes which democratically have been agreed that companies um, should pay. So I think that that's part of our responsible uh, capitalism agenda. And I do think there is more, um, though Amazon seems to be an outlier, <laughs> there is more increasingly a recognition that um, companies uh, do owe a uh, return to their host com countries, if, if you like. Final 30 um, seconds just to wrap up the OK, uh, I, I actually think uh, you know, you're, you may stop talking about mobile and just talk about broadband, because everyone expects it to be mobile. Now, there is stuff that we need. There's things that need to be done on infrastructure to make that possible. But there also is stuff on safety and security, because the security of mobile devices is a huge issue which is going to force us in the future. Okay, and Julian? Um, I mean, the simple answer to the taxation question is that everybody should pay the taxes they're supposed to do. There is stuff that we can do locally. There's also stuff that we will need to negotiate because there are there are genuine discussions about where some things should be taxed in which country. Um, but equally, there should be much more commitment to local countries. I think people think she's right. Companies are realising they don't get a good reputation mm. if they do things to dodge tax. You know, I don't think it was great for Pfizer, for example, when it became you know, quite clear that their main driver was paying less tax to people. Um, I think the mobile internet thing, you know, they are saying, I think one of the things is to make sure there are facilities in lots of places. I think one way of closing some of the divide is to have things more free Wi-Fi available. And I think we will find it a bit odd that we're in a position where there are lots of Wi-Fi signals around, but people can't access them without paying. I think we will see more of a transition to that, which will enable people to use their devices. People will want it. Cities are starting to invest in it already. I think we'll see more of it. Um, some of the things about the Internet of Things makes that much more sensible, much more easy to do uh, as well. In terms of connection times, uh, huge respect. I don't know the details of, of the technical thing. Um, I think there is a particular issue with some of the BT services. Um, and it would be quite nice if they were a bit more responsive, but also when people wanted to uh, provide um, very fast broadband to areas of BT were a bit more co cooperative with smaller companies that wish to innovate. Um, I think that might be a useful thing. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, have a very big round of applause uh, for our panellists, uh, Nadeem Zahawi, Chion Wura, and Julian Hupper. Please. Thank you.